sit down. And um, I'm welcome, welcome to everyone who's joining us. Um, this is going to be a great presentation. Um, I'm Andrea Tolzman from the Illinois Ornithological Society. I'm happy that you've all been able to join us tonight. And I'm um, excited to introduce this is a different kind of topic that we've had um, in the in the recent past. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to dig into some history that's connected to birds and birding. Um, so this will be a fascinating um, kind of a pathway that we haven't been down in a while. Um, so I'm excited to introduce Eric Rabain, who is here. He is an archivist. He has been researching the life of Nathan Leopold for the past 10 years, and he'll be talking about the connections um, and all the research that he did for his um, book, Arrested Adolescence. Um, he's all, he um, has worked for the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago History Museum, and he currently works for the Chicago Public Library. So we're very excited to have Eric Rabain. And with that, I'm gonna let him take it away and uh, talk to us about Nathan Leopold. <laughs> thank Thanks you very much. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. Oh, but... I'm sorry, can I, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, How dare if you? If you have questions, you can throw questions in the chat. Everyone should have access to the chat and then we'll do question and answer at the end. So if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. All right, thank you, Eric, and welcome. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we will begin the presentation. Excellent. Here we are, We're looking good. Okay, all right. Thank you everyone for joining me here tonight. My name is Eric Rebane, as was said. Um, I'd like to tell you about this infamous ornithologist, his crimes and the birding that he did along the way. Oh, how do I advance the slide? There we go. Okay, back before Nathan Leopold committed murder, he was born in 1904 in a mansion on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. His parents both came from wealthy German Jewish families. His father, Nathan Sr., made his money in copper mining as well as transportation and shipping on the Great Lakes. His mother, Flor Florence Foreman's family, had made their fortune in banking. Nathan Leopold Jr. was their youngest child. He had two older brothers, Sam and Mike, and an orphan cousin who also lived with them. Leopold was a precocious child who started speaking early and was extremely interested in languages, religion, and the natural world. His entire family spoke German and English, but Leopold would also study French, Italian, Spanish, Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, and a half dozen others before he graduated from college but his most consuming passion was to be found in nature. He started a bug collection as a young child, but that was just the beginning. When he was five years old, his father took him to the home of ornithologist Henry Cole, who gave Leopold his first ornithological specimens and encouraged him to start his own collection. Leopold took his advice to heart. He began collecting and donating bug and bird specimens to museums, starting when he gave a praying mantis to the Field Museum when he was just 11 years old. Bugs he was able to capture and pin at a young age, but for five years after meeting Cole, Leopold just identified birds around the area and bought or was given specimens from older birders. When he was 11 years old, he was instructed in field ornithology by, his, by two older neighbors. They would take the young birder to Jackson Park and other locations around Chicago, showing him how to make identifications, kill, and prepare his own specimens. Around that time, his family moved to a new home in Hyde Park, and Leopold took over a large room on the third floor, turning it into a museum and preparation room for his specimens. Here you can see the, wall, the walls lined with cabinets displaying his taxidermy pieces, and a large metal examination table stood in the middle of the room. He never learned to taxidermy his own birds, as he wasn't very skilled at working with his hands, but he often made study skins and would send out special birds to taxidermists around the city. His bird collection would eventually grow to over a thousand specimens. Not satisfied with just collecting, Leopold also began joining ornithological groups and going to their meetings. In 1917, when he was just 12 years old, he became a member of the American Ornithologists Union. His first articles were published within the AOU's journal, The Auk, the following year. Usually just short descriptions of out of season or range birds in the Chicago area. In 1920, Leopold and four of his birding friends compiled their life lists with notes of when they first saw specific birds each year and any unusual notes they had about them. 
they self-published this booklet as Spring Migration Notes of the Chicago Area. The AUK positively reviewed their effort, saying it was very carefully prepared and should be of much interest to other bird students of the district. Leopold was particularly flattered when prominent local ornithologist and founding member of the AOU, Ruthven Dean, asked for a copy, which Leopold was happy to provide him. Unfortunately, his ornithological successes didn't translate to popularity at school. As he started skipping grades, he was mocked in his yearbooks for his arrogance and because he liked birds and bugs more than sports. He was nicknamed Flea for his interest in etymology and his small stature. Obviously this hurt, but Leopold told himself that it proved he was different than the other children, better than them. He read a variety of philosophers who helped him develop this idea further and decided that he was a superior being and agreed with the hedonistic idea that his happiness mattered more than anything else. He would tell his family and friends that he wouldn't cross the room to save their lives as they meant less to him than the effort it would take. When Leopold graduated from high school at 15 years old, he became friends with a boy who would change the course of his life forever, Richard Loeb. Born in 1905 to Albert Loeb, who was first a lawyer and then vice president of Sears Roebuck, and Anna Bonin, the Loeb family was even wealthier than the Leopolds and much more socially prominent. They hosted orchestras, famous lecturers, chess exhibitions, and lavish parties in their mansions, and Richard was trained to be polite and charming to their prominent guests. Anna Loeb was also a birder and amateur botanist and had a bird garden designed for their Chicago home by prominent landscape architect Jens Jensen. With a birdhouse, covered feeding tray, a pond with shallow nooks for bathing, and bushes of edible berries, the Loebs had created a little haven for birds in the middle of the city. Richard Loeb didn't share his mother's love of birding, instead focusing more on school. His governess encouraged this, and he spent most of his childhood indoors reading rather than playing with other children. He was especially interested in history and French. Like Leopold, he was also self-publishing at an early age. At 11, he created a magazine in which he wrote an article about the horrors of World War I and a glowing review of an opera that he had recently seen. When Loeb entered high school at age 12, he expanded his social circle, joining the literary club and becoming freshman class treasurer. His friends noticed that he would sometimes steal things from his classmates in stores, but thought they were just harmless pranks. It took Loeb only two years to graduate from high school. By the time he became friends with Nathan Leopold, he had just finished his first year at the University of Chicago. His governess, who had watched him since he was four years old, had just left, and he was free from supervision for the first time in his life. Leopold and Loeb got to know each other as part of a mutual friend group, going to parties and college football games together. Loeb was curious to see how Leopold would react to his thieving, so when they were at a department store together, Loeb stole some pipes, and was delighted when Leopold helped rather than turning him in. In February of 1921, about nine months after becoming friends, Leopold and Loeb took a train ride up to the Loeb's vacation home in Charlevoix, Michigan. In their private compartment, they confessed some things to each other, Loeb admitting that he wanted to do more than petty larceny. He wanted to commit much more elaborate crimes, and Leopold admitting that he was gay and had a crush on Loeb. Their sexual relationship began that night. After they returned from vacation, the pair started acting out Loeb's plans. They started with prank calls and calling in false fire alarms, but it wasn't long before they escalated to felonies. They would steal cars and go joyriding, sometimes throwing bricks through car windshields and storefronts. They also began breaking and entering, often stealing things like piano benches and vacuums, just to inconvenience the homeowners. They also set fire to several shacks and outbuildings. They were never caught for these crimes, and it increased their growing senses of superiority and confidence. The summer after they got together, Leopold and Loeb spent more time at the Loeb's vacation home. There, Leopold and Anna Loeb would go birding together in the acres of bogs, flats, and forests on the property. One visiting naturalist recorded in his diary that summer that he, Leopold, and a friend got up at four in the morning to go birding and had a number of interesting experiences, the most interesting being running down a long continued song to find it that of a purple finch who sang on a branch near the high top of a fir tree. One night at this estate, a friend walked in on Leopold and Loeb while they were in bed together, and he began telling friends and classmates about their relationship. After that incident, 
Leopold and Loeb decided to transfer to the University of Michigan, but found that the rumors about them had reached there too. They agreed they should avoid each other in public, so they wouldn't feed into the stories. But Leopold had plenty to occupy himself in Michigan without Loeb. He became friendly with local birders, particularly Norman Aza Wood, a curator at Michigan's Museum of Zoology, and student Jocelyn Van Tyne. There are still seven study skins at the museum which Leopold donated during his time there. Six collected in the spring of 1922 when he was a student, and one a juvenile horned lark Leopold collected when he was 10 years old. Leopold found an important mentor in Wood. In 1903, Wood had discovered the first and second known nests of the elusive and endangered Kirtland's warbler and took 14 specimens. With his encouragement and guidance, Leopold and a friend tried to replicate that earlier discovery in the summer of 1922, but were unable to find any nests. Leopold only stayed at Michigan for one year before transferring back to the University of Chicago, where he reconnected with his birding friends and began collecting and publishing small articles in the Auk again. He and his friend George Porter Lewis also began teaching ornithology to groups of women and children around the area. That summer, the annual American Ornithologist Union's meeting was in Chicago, and on an outing to Lake Michigan, Leopold, Lewis, Cole, and many others saw 18 Franklin's gulls. One was shot and added to Leopold's collection, which you can see here. Shortly after that meeting, Leopold presented a paper he had written for the Chicago Ornitholog Ornithological Society, which would be later published in the AUK, Reason and Instinct in Bird Migration. He hypothesized that birds didn't follow instinct alone, but were constantly making decisions about where to fly, land, and nest. Though Leopold had failed in 1922 to find nesting Kirtland's warblers, he was determined to follow in Wood's footsteps, and after he graduated from the University of Chicago, he repeated the search in the summer of 1923, this time with more success. You'll be able to see Leopold in this video on the far left in the white shirt and hat. Leopold and a group of friends went to central Michigan. They paired up with James McGilvery from the Department of Conservation, who took this moving picture that you can see. As the first nest they found was in the densely forested area, the birders found a second nest in a more open space to accommodate the camera, though they still had to cut down two small trees to allow enough light into the nest so video could be taken. As the parents were avoiding the nest because of all the activity, the group began feeding horse flies to the lone baby warbler in the second nest. They also fed the adult male, who would occasionally come over to investigate, perching on their shoes. The group stayed in the area observing different groups of nesting warblers, making note of their behavior, and Leopold noticed that in several of the nests, brown-headed cowbirds had laid eggs, and that the norm for nests with hatchlings was one cowbird and one warbler, Leopold guessing that the cowbird had forced out three or four other baby warblers. He speculated that this could account for the warbler's small population, in addition to their very limited breeding range. The group stayed for six days, until on June 22nd, Leopold said, we were forced, much against our will, to leave the area. He did not elaborate on why they were forced to leave. When writing his account of the warblers in 1903, Norman Wood had been very open about killing them, giving a list of all the birds he killed and nests he took. But when Leopold gave his account in 1923, he had to be more discreet. Since Wood's collection, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 had been passed, and collecting the warblers was now illegal. But Leopold didn't let that stop him. He collected seven birds, a complete nest with two parents and four chicks, as well as a single adult male, which he made into a study skin. The nesting group was sent to a taxidermist at the Chicago Field Museum. Leopold rode the high from this trip, writing up an article about the warblers during the summer, and he was selected to present at the AOU's annual conference in October of 1923 at Harvard. He showed the footage and spoke about their trip, the AUK writing in its coverage of the event. It was indeed a rare treat to see moving pictures of such rare species. Leopold's article about the warblers was published in the AUK's next issue. While things seemed to have been going very well for Leopold, there was much that the public, his family, and most of his friends didn't see. He and Loeb com continued committing crimes together whenever they were in the same city, and he wrote a letter to Loeb while on the train to the AOU conference that laid bare his alarming personal philosophy. In discussing why he held Loeb up to a certain moral standard, he explained, In formulating a superman, he is, on account of certain superior qualities inherent in him, 
exempted from the laws of the ordinary laws which govern ordinary men. He is not liable for anything he may do. In the fall of 1923, when both Leopold and Loeb were back in Chicago and starting grad school, Loeb proposed an idea. They should drive to Michigan and burglarize Zeta Beta Tau, Loeb's old fraternity house. Leopold agreed, and they made their plans. On the night of November 10th, the pair drove up to Ann Arbor and crept through Loeb's old fraternity, wearing masks and carrying a chisel and guns in case they were confronted. But everyone was asleep, and they escaped with $74, equivalent to around $1,300 today, and many personal items stolen to annoy the fraternity members, like pens, medals, watches, and a typewriter. On the drive home, Loeb started looking to the next big crime they could commit together. He argued that the crimes they had been doing up to that point didn't prove that they were master criminals. He wanted to commit the perfect crime, something that was complicated and intricate, inspired a lot of media attention, left no clues, and would go down in history as a famous unsolved crime. Loeb had been fascinated by fictional criminals and detectives since childhood, and drew inspiration from these stories when planning his own crime. At first, Loeb proposed the idea of kidnapping a former fraternity brother he disliked. But after talking it over with Leopold, they realized he would be physically difficult to subdue, and his being far away in Michigan would make it inconvenient. So the talks turned to a local kidnapping of someone who would be easy to restrain and carry, a child. They decided a ransom scheme would be the perfect way to prove their mastery of criminality. It would be risky, but very rewarding. Without a specific victim in mind, they decided to kidnap a rich young boy whose father would be able to pay a ransom. They determined that they would have to kill their victim, so there was no chance of him identifying them later. The plan grew over the winter and into early spring, and in April of 1924, the pair were ready to start putting their plan into action. They bought supplies and went on several rehearsal runs along the murder and ransom route. On the evening of May 20th, the pair typed up their ransom note and the other notes they planned to use during the crime. As the victim was going to be left to chance, the notes were simply addressed, Dear Sir. On the morning of May 21st, Leopold went to his criminal law lecture and then met up with Loeb. Leopold rented a car, and he and Loeb drove it to the Leopold home to get ready. They placed all their supplies inside, the rope, chisel, ether, rags, hydrochloric acid, and ransom letter. At 2.15, they began their hunt. The pair concentrated on the area around the Harvard School for Boys, a private school in the Hyde Park neighborhood on the south side, which Leopold had also attended. They watched children playing in the schoolyard and empty lots in the area. They spent several hours at this, nearly selecting a young boy named Johnny Levinson, but when he disappeared down an alley and they were unable to find him, they had to start searching for another victim. It was now getting late, around 5 p.m., when they spotted 14-year-old Bobby Franks walking home from the Harvard School. Despite popular belief, Bobby was not Loeb's second cousin, but they did live across the street from each other, and Bobby sometimes played tennis on the Loeb court with other neighborhood children. He was the youngest son of Flora and Jacob Franks, who made his fortune in real estate and had owned the Rockford Watch Company. Bobby was a freshman at the Harvard School, and that year had been part of the junior team who debated against capital punishment in the school's debate society. That afternoon, Bobby had finished umpiring a game of baseball in the schoolyard, and was walking toward home when he was spotted. Leopold and Loeb pulled up beside him, and Loeb asked Bobby if he wanted a ride. Bobby said no, he only had another block to go. Loeb urged him to get in, though, saying he wanted to talk to him about his tennis racket, as he wanted to get a similar one for his younger brother. Bobby obliged and got into the passenger seat. When they turned the corner leading away from Bobby's house, Loeb hit him on the head several times with the blunt end of a chisel. They had expected this to knock Bobby out, but as he continued to moan, Loeb dragged Bobby into the back seat and stuffed a rag in his mouth. Bobby soon grew quiet and still. The pair drove out of the city and separated Bobby's possessions into what would and wouldn't burn, then buried his shoes, belt, and a school pin that he had been wearing. They continued to drive around, waiting for dark, stopping for a dinner of hot dogs and root beer to pass the time. As the sun was setting, they drove to a forest preserve on the south side of Chicago an isolated stretch of land between Hyde and Wolf Lakes. The location, of course, had been chosen by Leopold, this being one of his favorite places to go birding. Leopold and Loeb undressed Bobby, 
carried him in a blanket, and set him down near a culvert which ran under a railroad in between the two lakes. They had intended to strangle him to death, each pulling on one end of a rope, so they would be equally culpable for the murder. But as Bobby lay still in the grass, they discovered that he had already died, suffocated by the rags without them noticing. They poured hydrochloric acid over his face and body, hoping to disguise his identity if he was found. They then lowered him into the water, and Leopold pushed and kicked his body into the culvert until they were sure he was hidden. After disposing of the body, Leopold and Loeb stopped to mail the ransom note and make a phone call to the Franks family, then burned Bobby's clothes in the Loeb family furnace and tried to clean up some of the blood from the car before going to sleep for the night. Bobby's family was frantic by this point. They had begun to worry when Bobby didn't come home for dinner and started calling his friends and looking around the neighborhood for him. Jacob Franks was searching the Harvard school to see if Bobby had gotten locked inside when Flora Franks received a phone call. Leopold told her that her son had been kidnapped, but was unharmed, and that further instructions would follow on how to get him back. The family deliberated on what to do, but decided to wait for more information, hoping that if they followed the instructions, Bobby would be returned safely. They received the ransom letter the following morning, which instructed Mr. Franks to take out $10,000 from the bank and await further instructions. It also warned them not to contact the police if they wanted to see their son alive again. The morning that the ransom note arrived, Leopold and Loeb were preparing to finish the rest of their plan. They cleaned the rental car more thoroughly and set up a series of steps Jacob Franks would have to take to give them the ransom. They planned to have Franks take a taxi to a drugstore, then have him take another taxi to a train station, where he would have to catch a specific train. On that train would be another note telling Franks to throw the ransom money from the last train car after it had passed a specific building. Leopold and Loeb would be waiting along the tracks, ready to grab the money and drive away before police could catch them. They thought this was a brilliant plan and a foolproof way to avoid getting caught. Except for one problem. Bobby's body had already been found. A man walking along the railroad tracks had spotted Bobby's feet within the culvert, and he and some railroad workers pulled the body out. Bobby was taken by police to a Southside morgue, where he was identified by his uncle a couple hours later. Less than 24 hours after Leopold and Loeb committed their so-called perfect crime, and it had already fallen apart. Despite the dismal execution of their plan, Leopold and Loeb still got to enjoy the fallout, as the city of Chicago was rocked by the news of Bobby's kidnap and murder. The wealth of Bobby's family and the fact that the killers had tried to get a ransom after the boy was dead meant speculation about the killer and motive were rampant. Police chased down leads all over the city, and especially targeted several of Bobby's teachers, who they thought may have been gay and trying to molest Bobby. Hundreds of tips came in, most of them unhelpful, and Leopold and Loeb hung on every news article and excitedly discussed the case with family and friends. They also disposed of the rest of the evidence. They returned the rental car, went to the lakeshore to burn the blanket they had used to conceal and carry Bobby's body, and they drove to the Jackson Park Lagoon, tossing in the typewriter they had used to type up the ransom notes. The killers felt free to enjoy the publicity, convinced that the crime could never be traced back to them. But Leopold got a reality check when the newspapers reported that a pair of glasses had been found next to Bobby's body. Leopold recognized the photo in the paper. He'd worn a pair of glasses for reading the previous fall, but he hadn't worn them in months, and realized that the glasses must have been sitting forgotten in the inside pocket of the suit he'd worn during the murder. He'd removed his jacket when getting Bobby into the water, and either then, or when Loeb picked the jacket up to hand to him, the glasses must have fallen out, unseen, in the darkness. Leopold was called in by the police on May 25th, and taken to a police station on the south side of Chicago, where he was questioned about his activities burning in the area, and asked to give the names of others who frequented the forest preserve. When asked if he wore glasses, Leopold replied that he didn't, and he was released. He hoped that would be the end of it, but even though his glasses were a very common prescription and frame, police were able to trace them to Leopold because they contained a new hinge, which the glasses company was just starting to roll out in Chicago, and only three pairs had been sold with that exact prescription, frame, and hinge combination. When this was discovered, Leopold was once again taken into police custody on May 29th. When asked to explain how his glasses had ended up at the scene of the body disposal, Leopold said he'd been birding in the area that, the weekend before the murder, and he must have lost them then. This was verified through the records of the Forest Preserve and the friends Leopold went birding with, but police still weren't satisfied. 
They asked what Leopold had been doing the day of the murder, and he claimed he didn't remember. But his interrogators weren't buying it. Leopold couldn't help himself. He'd already revealed to them that he had a remarkable memory. He had showed them his trick for memorizing a list of words forward and backward in only a few minutes, and had perfect detailed recollections of other days from many months ago. So Leopold told the alibi he and Lope had arranged, that they had been driving around in Leopold's car and drinking, had picked up a couple girls, dropped them off again when the girls wouldn't have sex, and then gone home for the night. Leopold said he, couldn't rem he could only remember the girls' first names and knew nothing else about them, so the only other person who could verify his story was Richard Loeb, who was also taken into custody. For a while, Loeb also refused to give an alibi, claiming he didn't remember exactly what he had done on the day Bobby disappeared either. But eventually, he picked up on some clues and also started using their alibi explaining he hadn't wanted to say what he had done because he didn't want his family to find out he'd been drinking and picking up girls. Police searched the homes of both teenagers, finding some suspicious items but no direct clues. But a couple of reporters were able to furnish the critical pieces of evidence. A typewriting expert determined that the ransom note had been typed on an Underwood portable typewriter, and though one wasn't found in the Leopold or Loeb homes, the Leopold's maid said one had been there a few weeks ago. Reporters found members of Leopold's law study group and were able to gather sheets that Leopold had typed on the Underwood and passed out as study aids. The type on the study sheets matched the ransom note, down to the same misaligned letters, proving that they had been typed on the exact same machine. Still, Leopold and Loeb refused to confess. But their alibi was completely shattered when the Leopold chauffeur came in and said it would have been impossible for Leopold and Loeb to have been driving around in Leopold's car, as they claimed, because the chauffeur had been working on it in the garage the afternoon of the murder. With all this and more stacked against them, men from the state's attorney's office confronted Loeb, laying out all the evidence they had gathered and urged him to tell the truth. He broke down and confessed. When they had gathered enough information, Officials went into Leopold's room and gave specific details from Loeb's confession, until Leopold was forced to conclude that Loeb had confessed, and he gave his confession as well. The confessions were very detailed and extremely similar except for one main point. Both accused the other of hitting Bobby with the chisel and stuffing the rag in his mouth. While it's never been definitively proven which of the pair did the actual killing, I think that more evidence points to Loeb being the murderer while Leopold drove the car. With these confessions, a story that had already been a huge media sensation exploded across the country. The entire United States was fascinated with this crime and eager to learn more about what could have made two promising, intelligent young men from wealthy families kill a teenager. Though shocked by the revelations, the Leopold and Loeb families quickly hired some lawyers to handle the case. Benjamin Bachrock, the Leopold's family lawyer, had been keeping tabs for the family since Leopold was arrested, but they decided he wouldn't be enough. Instead, the families decided to enlist the help of another more famous lawyer, Clarence Darrow. Darrow was 67 when he took the case, and had spent decades as a lawyer, author, and orator. He had often spoken against capital punishment, and saw this case as a perfect opportunity to speak about the topic on a national level. Benjamin Bachrock and his brother Walter were also hired to work on the case beside Darrow. Leopold's interest in birds was highlighted in the massive amount of newspaper coverage inspired by the case. Reporters said that he hypnotized birds and had a strange, almost supernatural power over them. Readers seemed enthralled with the idea that Leopold could tenderly feed a baby bird one minute and kill it the next, theorizing that it showed his lack of empathy for humans as well. Leopold's old birding friend Jocelyn Van Tyne read about Leopold's confession and had an interesting reaction. As he relayed in a letter to his mother, Last night I picked up the paper and was shocked to see the horrible news about Leopold. The thing has rather haunted me since. I knew him well enough so that I can see how it happened, except for the motive. That's beyond me. Though, At first, Darrow expected to use insanity as a defense. He had Leopold and Loeb plead not guilty and set them up with extensive psychiatric testing. After weeks of these tests, half a dozen psychiatrists concluded that Leopold and Loeb were insane and that they were acting off of delusional thinking and couldn't fully comprehend or control what they did. They were diagnosed with a host of mental illnesses, most of which no longer exist, including dementia precox, psychopathic inferiority, paranoid psychosis, and abnormal sexuality. But as the media continued to publish stories about the killers and the defense tests, it became clear that it would be very difficult to get a jury to believe that Leopold and Loeb were insane. 
They just didn't seem to fit what the public traditionally thought of as insanity. Both were intelligent, eloquent, and, as was made obvious when they talked to reporters in daily interviews, frighteningly ordinary. Darrow realized he would have to change his strategy. So two months into the proceedings, he surprised the court by changing the pleas from not guilty to guilty. This left the prosecution with little time to adjust and removed the jury, placing the entirety of the responsibility for the sentence in the hands of the judge. Though their guilt was no longer in question, the state still proceeded as if this was a trial. The state's attorney introduced nearly 100 witnesses who testified to every inch of the route Leopold and Loeb took, tying them to every piece of evidence. Store clerks identified them as the ones who had bought the rope, chisel, and acid, and friends testified to Leopold and Loeb's normal, intelligent behavior. The state hoped to prove that the killers had been rational, methodical, and cold-blooded. To contrast this, the defense presented witnesses who testified that Leopold and Loeb were irrational, immature, and for Leopold, that he was obsessed with the idea that he and Loeb were akin to Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of the Superman. Darrow and his team hoped they could prove that Though not legally insane, Leopold and Loeb were not entirely mentally well, and that this should mitigate their sentences. This contrast of ideas was amplified by the battle between the defense and state psychiatrists, who clashed on this idea. The defense psychiatrists talked at length about the mental conditions of Leopold and Loeb, their sexual fantasies, Leopold's enormous ego, and Loeb's feeling of feelings of inferiority. The defense psychiatrists also testified about the defendant's skulls and glands, hoping to find a physical reason for their bizarre behavior. The state psychiatrists were unimpressed, refuting every point the defense made. They and the public were particularly cr critical of the defense saying that Leopold and Loeb had been too privileged, and that the amount of money they grew up with had warped their perceptions of the world. With all the money the families were paying for the very lawyers and psychiatrists who were trying to blame their problems on money, it seemed to many like a hollow gesture. In late August, when the hearing closed, it was anyone's guess which side the judge would lean, and what sentence he may impose, life imprisonment or death by hanging. The sentencing hearing was over, and all that was left to do was wait until September 10th, when the sentence would be passed. Photos and stories about Leopold's ornithological collection had been published in the newspapers, and when he found out Leopold was thinking of donation, Benjamin Berryman was determined to obtain them. Berryman was president of the Elgin Audubon Society, and the society had recently acquired and fixed up a local museum, but they needed more specimens. Elgin's mayor gave Berryman a letter of introduction to Cook County's warden, and he was able to secure a visit with Leopold. Apparently, he was persuasive, because Leopold agreed to donate around 1,500 birds and other natural collections to Elgin. This included not only birds that Leopold had killed himself, but also birds that he had bought, those killed by his family members, as well as eggs, nests, minerals, butterflies, and a sailfish Leopold had caught off the coast of Florida. There was some backlash from the community when this was announced. Letters were sent to local newspapers, and one man said it would be a disgrace for the museum to accept the donation, and a woman predicted that it would attract the wrong kind of visitors. Even some members of the museum's board of directors were opposed to Leopold's birds being included in the collection. Berryman assured the public and the board that Leopold's name wouldn't be printed anywhere, and that there wouldn't be one big Leopold exhibit. Instead, the birds would simply be mixed in with others that were already on display. No one would realize they were looking at birds that had once been owned by a murderer. Regardless, the publicity the museum received about the donation caused a welcome spike in visitors, whether they were there for the right reasons or not. While Elgin got the majority of his collection, Leopold saved his choicest specimens for the Field Museum. To them, he gifted 10 study skins, which were in some way rare or unusual for the area. Most of the birds Leopold wrote about in the Auk ended up here. He also left his taxidermy mount of the Kirtland's Warbler Group, though it hadn't yet been completed. When it was finally time for the sentence to be read, hundreds of people waited outside of the courthouse, eager for the verdict. When court was in session, the judge read his decision. It would be life in prison for the murder and 99 years for the kidnapping, the judge recommending that they never be paroled. He explained that he was influenced not by the psychiatric testimony, but the age of the defendants, who were 19 at the time. In 1924, a minor was considered to be anyone under the age of 21, and he said, The records of Illinois show only two cases of minors who were put to death by legal process. 
to which number the court does not feel inclined to make an addition. The public was not so sympathetic. Around the world, many voiced their displeasure about the sentence. Politicians worrying that it would cause a surge of crime, lawyers worrying it set a dangerous precedent of favoring rich defendants over poor, and ordinary people just plain mad that justice wasn't being done. Because of the backlash and plenty of death threats, when Leopold and Loeb were taken to prison the following night, they had to have a heavy police escort. At around 10 p.m. on September 11th, the pair entered Joliet State Penitentiary for the first time. Joliet Prison has been featured in several famous movies and TV shows, including The Blues Brothers and Prison Break, and was active for nearly 150 years before closing in 2002. But for all its fame and longevity, Joliet was a pretty terrible prison. Made of limestone with few windows, little ventilation, and no toilets in the cells until the 1950s, the prison was a dark, smelly, depressing place. Leopold and Loeb tried to adapt to their new home, both separated into cells on opposite wings of the prison and placed in different menial jobs, Leopold weaving rattan chair seats and Loeb building the chair frames. They saw each other occasionally, but the prison administration thought they were bad influences on each other and kept them separated as much as possible. This was helped when on May of 1925, Leopold had to get an appendectomy, and he was transferred again to the more modern Stateville prison five miles from Joliet, which had a fully equipped hospital. Both Joliet and Stateville were under the supervision of the same warden, and Stateville had been meant to replace Joliet, but after it was built, they were both so overcrowded that they were forced to stay open. Leopold enjoyed Stateville much more than Joliet. Unlike the old prison, Stateville had ample windows and allowed prisoners recreation time outside, giving him a chance to see birds again. He kept up his life lists, though he was only ever able to see a dozen or so species a year. He also began breeding horned larks and robins, carrying them around in his shirt pocket for frequent feedings when they were still fledglings. Initially, Leopold and other prisoners had to capture and breed wild birds if they wanted to raise them for pets or food. But in the late 1920s, the administration began allowing them to keep canaries. Interest in the hobby exploded throughout Stateville as prisoners began breeding them to sell to pet stores, until there were thousands of canaries cluttering up the cells, much to Leopold's delight. Once he started working in the prison's library, he used the attic to house his many canaries. He had a large cage built, eight feet long and two and a half feet high, where he bred and raised the birds, giving some as gifts to family and friends on the outside. Leopold also continued his studies, taking classes in math and a dozen or so foreign languages from universities by correspondence. He even exchanged a few letters with Albert Einstein regarding his studies into the theory of relativity. Despite this, Leopold was frequently in trouble. His punishment record from Stateville proves that. He would get caught stealing food, carrying contraband, fighting with other inmates, and a host of other offenses. He was constantly looking for ways to get around the rules and still being forced to work in the low-level shops, so he had little status in prison beyond what his family's money could buy him. He was even transferred back to Joliet in 1930 after it was discovered that he had been forging his boss's signature. When Leopold was sent to Joliet, Loeb was transferred to Stateville to make sure they were kept separated. But Leopold was determ re determined to return, and after talks with the warden and promises of good behavior in the future, he was allowed back to the new prison in 1931. Now in the same prison, Leopold and Loeb reconnected and began spending much of their time together. The prison library had been burned down in a recent riot, and Leopold was tasked with rebuilding it and introducing a new cataloging system. Loeb could often be found working side by side with him when a large book donation came in. Leopold and Loeb also became friends with the sociologists who worked in the prison, and eventually they would help develop a way of predicting which inmates would succeed on parole and which would end up back in prison. Leopold and Loeb also created a, a booklet at advising paroled prisoners on how to return to civilian life, and perhaps the most noteworthy of their joint prison activities. Together they created the Stateville Correspondence School. Until then, the prison only held classes up to 8th grade, and they were very poorly attended. Leopold and Loeb added an entire high school curriculum and many college courses, and the degrees and credits obtained within were accepted by many outside universities. Loeb even wrote an entire English textbook specifically designed for adult prisoners. This stretch of years, from 1931 to 1935, was Leopold's favorite time in prison. He said about this period, I wasn't even conscious of doing time anymore. Living here was just a convenience for my work. 
It helped that Leopold, with his money and outside connections, now had plenty of power. Stateville during these years was controlled largely by the prisoners. They grew marijuana in the prison yard, gambling and alcohol distilling flourished, and it was rare to get in serious trouble if you knew how to handle the guards. Leopold and Loeb enjoyed these luxuries, and Leopold shared his good fortune with his sexual partners, younger men who he showered with gifts and made sure they had good jobs, cells, and helped them get set up once they were paroled. This golden era came to an end on January 28, 1936. The day started off normally. Leopold, Loeb, and their cellmates ate breakfast together, and then Leopold and Loeb worked on a new class for the school for most of the morning, before Loeb went to take a shower around noon. Less than an hour later, Leopold was running toward the prison hospital after hearing that Loeb had been attacked. Loeb had been slashed and stabbed more than 50 times in the prison shower by another inmate named James Day. Day claimed that Loeb had pulled a razor out and threatened to rape him, causing a fight, and during the struggle, Day had killed Loeb in self-defense. This made little sense, as Day had no injuries, and Loeb's injuries were so extensive, including having his throat slit from behind. It was later found out that Day was the one who bought, brought the razor to the bathroom, but the real reason why he attacked Loeb is still unknown. Though doctors tried to save Loeb's life, he died that afternoon. Loeb's death had a profound impact on Leopold. They had spent every day together for the past four years, and he had been Leopold's closest friend and confidant. For several years after his death, Leopold took on the role of the director of the correspondence school they had started together, to keep it going as a living memorial for Loeb. But after a while, he turned it over to other inmates, and chose to do janitorial work instead. He stayed this way until 1945, when in the midst of World War II, doctors from the University of Chicago came to Stateville to conduct studies on how malaria was transmitted and various ways it could be cured. Leopold was one of hundreds of inmate volunteers who joined the effort. In addition to be, being infected with malaria himself, he also worked as a nurse on the project, attending to other sick volunteers, raising the mosquitoes which would transmit the disease, and doing statistical analysis on the patient's blood work. Because of their efforts, Leopold and most of the other inmate volunteers had time taken off their sentences, and for Leopold, this meant he would become eligible for parole in 1953. With a date to shoot for, Leopold and his family began to talk strategy. They set up interviews with reporters who promised to write positive articles, and Leopold talked about his belief in God and the good work he did on the school, library, and malaria project, avoiding the topic of the Franks murder as much as possible. When it was impossible to ignore, Leopold stated that he felt daily remorse and had completely changed and no longer understood how he thought back in 1924. Leopold and his team were able to get many prominent voices on their side. Stateville's prison warden and one of the assistant state's attorneys who had prosecuted him sp speaking up in favor of his release from prison. Leopold also wrote an autobiography which would more heavily detail the good works he had done in prison and emphasize his growth and change. Hundreds of letters were sent to the parole board and governor, both positive and negative, from citizens voicing their opinions on if Leopold should be paroled or not. Leopold went through three parole hearings, with witnesses including poet Carl Sandburg and best-selling author Meyer Levin speaking about Leopold's good character. With every failed attempt, the publicity around his release got a little bit better, and in 1958, Leopold was granted his parole. As he stood on the steps of the penitentiary, which had been his home for the past 30 years, Leopold made a plea for privacy to the gathered reporters. Switching to social work, befriending the other workers and volunteers on the project, 
Almost all of the brethren, volunteers, and staff I talked with had fond memories of Leopold, remembering him as hardworking, kind, and very intelligent. But it didn't take long for him to grow tired of the tiny community. Leopold was overwhelmed with the amount of new birds he could see in Puerto Rico, going birding whenever his busy schedule permitted. In May, he went on his first major birding trip in 34 years, going with one of the brethren volunteers to the Laguna Cartagena and the Cabo Rojo Lighthouse, where they saw 68 species. In 1959, Leopold enrolled at the University of Puerto Rico and moved to San Juan, where he appreciated the nightlife and faster pace. As he was studying for a master's degree in social work and teaching algebra in night school, he was also raising money for the brethren so they could build a new hospital. But despite his appearance of piousness, he was also breaking nearly all of his parole restrictions, drinking, using guns for birding, and breaking sodomy laws. Since Leopold had arrived on the island, he had begun befriending poor teenagers, trying to court them in the same way he had his partners in prison. And it often worked. The boys so desperate for money, they were willing to do what Leopold asked of them. He also went to gay bars, public parks, and beaches, where he picked up male sex workers. A man who went birding with Leopold remembered that he would often take boys along on his trips, and he wondered about the nature of their relationship. To, to cover himself, Leopold dated women as well, including women who only knew about him through his book and newspaper articles. These fans, as he called them, would shower Leopold with gifts and fly to the island for the honor of spending a week with the murderer. In spite of his philandering, Leopold ended up settling down with a widow named Trudy Feldman, who ran a florist shop. The pair met at a Seder shortly after Leopold was released from prison, and they began collaborating on fundraising events. They married in 1961 and lived in an apartment in San Juan with a series of small dogs that Leopold doted on. After graduation, Leopold did research for the Department of Public Health, going to various parts of the island and studying topics including nutrition, parasites, and female sterilization. Leopold was also part of a small group who helped publicize that the Puerto Rican plane pigeon, thought to have been extinct since the 1910s, wasn't gone after all. He and his ornithologist friend, Frank Wadsworth, began hearing stories that plane pigeons were being shot and even sold for food around Cedra, a centrally located city. In November of 1963, the pair decided to follow up on these leads. On November 5th, in the early morning, they went to a lake near Cedra, but had no luck hearing anything out of the ordinary. After a couple hours, they went to a site a couple miles away and spotted seven birds sitting on a telephone wire over a field. Both birders looked through a scope and read each other descriptions of the plane pigeon. The descriptions matched what they were seeing. Not content with site verification, Leopold obtained a collector's permit through Puerto Rico's Secretary of Agriculture and collected two specimens, and it was confirmed they were plane pigeons. As it turned out, these weren't the first specimens taken in Puerto Rico since the 1910s. Leopold later found others which had been taken, and even one that had been mounted. They just hadn't been it just hadn't been talked about in the wider birding community. In part because of Leopold and Wadsworth, ornithologists began to pay cl closer attention to the pigeon, and in the early 1970s, efforts were made to help the struggling population. Though still small, the Puerto Rican plain pigeon population has grown dramatically after its brush with near extinction. After Leopold's parole period was up, he celebrated by traveling the world with Trudy. They stopped first in Chicago and Philadelphia to see his and Trudy's families before going on a cruise and touring around Europe. They spent three months seeing the sights, monuments, and going to concerts while staying at five-star hotels or the homes of hospitable friends. When they returned to Puerto Rico, Leopold had a job lined up for him. He had received a grant to head up a three-year project trying to discover how parasites were transmitted among lower-income families and hopefully how to slow it down. He loved the work and spent long hours on it in the field and in the lab, developing a safe way to trace the transmission and see what areas of the home held the most contagions. In 1963, Leopold returned to Chicago to visit family and friends, and while there, his friends Harold and Leona Rowe had a surprise for him. They drove him to the Elgin Public Museum, which was closed for painting, and a curator gave them a private tour of the entire museum, where Leopold was able to see his bird collection for the first time in almost 40 years. As the curator showed Leopold in the rows around, pointing out Leopold's donated birds, the curator admitted that, just for a test, I deliberately pointed out wrong birds, but he caught me every time. I think it's very remarkable to remember his own collection after all these years. 
Leopold himself said seeing the birds and their tags written in his handwriting from so long ago nearly brought him to tears. In addition to the birds on display, the curator also showed Leopold their storage room and the materials from his donation that weren't on display, including the sailfish Leopold had donated. Because the top fin had broken off, it was doubtful that it would ever be displayed again, so Leopold asked if he could have it back. This was granted, the fish was put back together, and proudly hung on the wall of Leopold's study back in Puerto Rico. Feeling nostalgic after that trip to Elgin, Leopold reached out to Chicago's Field Museum to see if his Kirtland's Warbler group was being displayed. They replied that it wasn't. It had never even been taken out of the paper it was wrapped in when it had been delivered in 1925. As the museum had no plans to display it, they were happy to give it back to Leopold, and for several years it sat in his living room. But in 1965, Leopold had it transferred to the Cranbrook Institute of Science in Michigan. He was tickled that the movements of the taxidermy piece nearly mimicked the warbler's migratory route. The Kirtland's Warbler Group was displayed at Cranbrook for many years and featured prominently in the museum's promotional materials, but it has since disappeared. Cranbrook still has several dozen letters from Leopold relating to his donation, but no one seems to know where the display itself went. Now that he was off parole and settling into his life of freedom, Leopold found himself a sort of notorious celebrity. He became friends with Hugh Hefner, who showed him around the Playboy Mansion and gave him a free subscription to Playboy, and musician Sammy Davis Jr., who had advocated for his release from parole and performed a concert for Leopold's personal charity. When he was released from prison, Leopold claimed he wanted privacy and to avoid publicity, but now he embraced it. He used his visibility to speak publicly about topics that were important to him, like reforming prisons and abolishing the death penalty. He was often a guest speaker at universities and conventions. He also hadn't given up his love of birding, obviously, and was a prominent member of Puerto Rico's Natural History Society, and always to be found if rare birds were spotted on the island. In 1968, Leopold turned his attention to a different bird species endemic to the island, the Puerto Rican parrot. Endangered in Leopold's time and still endangered today, the Puerto Rican parrot has had a difficult time coexisting with humans. They nest in old growth trees by creating cavity nests at least three feet deep. As humans began clearing the forests, the areas with trees large enough for the parrots to nest in shrank, until the present day when they are only found in a small section of the El Yunque rainforest. The chicks are also popular as pets, so people would often steal eggs and chicks from parrots' nests, significantly reducing the amount of wild birds. In the late 60s and 70s, ornithologists in Puerto Rico were trying various ways to revitalize the population, including building artificial nests for the birds and breeding them in captivity. Leopold helped gather data, at one point camping for 10 days in El Yunque to observe and take notes of the birds in their nests. He also took color photos inside a nest and helped other birders take a census of them. But despite all this talk about Leopold's supposed rehabilitation and remorse, he still lived by the same hedonistic philosophy that he cited as his reason for committing murder back in 1924. As he says in this letter from 1970, I am an individual hedonist, a fellow who believes that his own pleasure is the only good in the world. Out of the thousands of his letters that I've read, I've never seen Leopold mention Bobby Franks or remorse, except when he was trying to get paroled. Leopold loved to be busy, to fill his days with good food, drink, cigarettes, work, and pleasure, but eventually this began to take a toll on his body. During the last year of his life, Leopold suffered a series of heart attacks and other medical problems, which often left him hospitalized. He fought against his body, bouncing back after each hospitalization to do more traveling, working, and planning future projects, just to have his body shut down again. After one such hospitalization, he died on August 29, 1971, at 66 years old. Leopold's passing was greeted with a flurry of publicity, with newspapers around the country heralding Leopold as a perfect example of how the rehabilitation of prisoners is possible. Leopold's wife Trudy was uncomfortable with this, as she knew him better than most, and enraged when she found out how much money Leopold was leaving to other lovers in his will. She planned to write a tell-all style biography, which would reveal his private life to the world, but she died before she could achieve that goal. And because of that, Leopold's legacy has been one of rehabilitation and service, without the nuance of what he was doing behind the scenes. Though, of course, what most people still know Leopold for is the murder that he and Loeb committed. And despite nearing its 100th anniversary, this crime is still one that captures people's imaginations, so much so that there have been dozens and dozens of fictional adaptations. 
books, movies, TV shows, plays, comics, songs, poems, a ballet, an interpretive dance, a musical, and an opera. Many of these fictional adaptations emphasize Leopold's fascination for ornithology, sometimes using it to humanize him, and other times using it to show him as off-putting, with a morbid curiosity for killing and death. The birds that Leopold collected during his life have been scattered all over the country, with 10 still at the Chicago Field Museum, 33 at the University of Puerto Rico, 7 at the University of Michigan, and even Texas A&M has one Puerto Rican toady, which was shot by Leopold in 1964. And of course, the Elgin Public Museum. When Leopold visited the museum in the 60s, apparently all of the more than a thousand birds he donated were still there, and many were on display, and curators knew which were Leopold's birds. But since then, that knowledge has been lost. Curators today have been able to find records for only 16 birds which they can prove came from Leopold. As Elgin doesn't have the best kept records, it seems impossible to know just how many of Leopold's birds remain with us in the world today. Thank you for joining me tonight to hear about Nathan Leopold and his ornithology, and thank you to the Illinois Ornithological Society for hosting this talk. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this case, you could buy my book or rent it from your local library. You can also check out my website or my Twitter, uh, and I run a WordPress with more information that you could ever possibly want. Um, and now I think we could take it over to questions, if anyone has questions. Thank you so much, Eric. That was fascinating. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I will open it up. Anybody who wants to ask a question, um, you can feel free to just unmute yourself and um, ask any questions that you have. Um, I will say I was writing down a few and you literally answered them all <laughs> as we went. Oh. So awesome. Very like, yeah, it was it was really fascinating. And uh, my own trip to the Elgin Public Museum years ago, I had no idea. And now I'm like so curious. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I think they still have their display of the the last photo I showed. Mm -hmm. They had they had a little display of all 16 that they knew were his. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now it's, it's worth a trip back, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll be there in May as well, giving a talk. <laughs> great. That's great. So yeah, feel free if you have questions for Eric, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask whatever you'd like or comments. And now, um, Eric, I don't know if you want to unmute or no, actually I'm gonna leave leave your leave the slide up um, so that people can write that down too as, as they're, uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna... Um, so you researched the book for about 10 years, you said, um, which is, I mean, I'm sure it was a, a lot of winding pathways. Um, yeah. Is there, to your knowledge, um, is, has, does this um, coincide with other research that's been done or is this kind of the definitive source? Oh, I don't know if it's the definitive source. I, I did it kind of on my own. Like, I've been in contact with a lot of other researchers, but mostly, I don't know if there's a ton who are doing what I'm doing currently. Most of the researchers I know of were from the 70s and 80s, and mm -hmm. I've talked to them. Um, but yeah, there's it's kind of gotten into a bit of a lull of, of research recently. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question that just popped into the chat. Um, mm -hmm. From Jared Hitchings, he asked, did Albert Einstein um, actually respond to Leopold while he was incarcerated? Yes, he did. They exchanged, I think, two or three letters. So Leopold had a family member who was a physicist who knew Einstein. And so they would kind of trade the letters through him. Um, and uh, Leopold at the time was studying math because he wanted to get a better understanding of the theory of relativity he had actually met also he had met einstein in 1921 when einstein was doing his first u.s tour uh just very briefly at a party but um yeah so leopold uh sent a letter asking einstein like hey i want to understand relativity can you tell me what i should do and einstein was like yeah you should like learn this kind of stuff and take these, these math classes and then i think it was like four or five years later Leopold wrote like a 40, 50 page paper about relativity and he sent it to Einstein who read it and critiqued it back to him. Uh, so yeah, they, they did exchange some letters. Oh, well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? 
um, or comments about the the story or the person. I know it's it's a lot to wrap my head around actually because I didn't didn't know that past the famous you know obviously the one incident. Yeah, comments are about just how a uh, kind of stunning the whole story is. Yeah, it's truth is sometimes crazier than fiction in this case. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a good true crime story. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so what other, um, I know you currently work at the Chicago Public Library. So what kind of work do you do um, for the library system these days? I'm, I'm an archivist. So I work at the Woodson Regional Branch, which is a really south side branch. Mm -hmm. And they are one of three libraries in the system with their own archive. And so what I do is take backlogged collections that were donated however long ago and, you know, process them and make them available to researchers. So that's that's what I do. Oh, fascinating. Did you find in doing that and your other work and your other jobs, like through the Chicago History Museum, is that how you started hearing and finding sources for this book? No, actually, I'd done most of the majority of my research was done before this. Uh, it, most of it I did while I was still in college. Um, and then it was just kind of serendipitous that I came to Chicago because I was applying to places all over the country when I graduated uh, with my master's in library science. And the Tribune was just the one who said yes. So <laughs> I ended up here and it was great because I am able to do more research, even though the bulk of it had already been done. Right, right. Um, another question came in um, from Gerald asking, where are all the documents of uh, Leopold's documents and letters and all that stuff? Where is that being kept now? That So Leopold donated about 50 boxes of his material uh, to the Chicago History Museum. So a lot of it is there. Uh, Leopold's lawyer, Elmer Gertz, also donated about 50 boxes of material to Northwestern University. So a lot of it is there. Um, I myself have been to like, 40, 50 archives around the country, uh, you know, from California to like Massachusetts. Um, there's stuff at Johns Hopkins. There's stuff at, I really want to get to the University of Wyoming. Um, there's, it's all over, but the biggest collections are probably uh, the History Museum, Northwestern, and the Library of Congress also has a pretty big collection because that's where Darrow's papers are and some of Gertz's as well. Yeah. Um, Jared just wrote, one of the more tragic figures was the murder victim Bobby Frank's mother. Um, could you share a little bit about her background in the Christian science um, um, and how that was portrayed during the trial and by the press? Yes. So Flora Franks, the, the victim's mother, Christian scientists, the whole family, the full Franks family had converted to Christian science. And Christian scientists don't really believe in a concept of death they believe that the spirit is immortal you know like even though the like nothing about the body that's why they don't do medicine and things like that so like the physical body is not real it's just the spirit um so flora franks would say things like bobby isn't dead i'm going to see him again things like that which the press spun to be she's she went insane with grief and she thinks her son is coming home and stuff like that um and they they just were spinning that story when it's just the, her faith. And that's the, like the epitaph on Bobby's grave is a quote about, you know, like the spirit being immortal. And one of Bobby's, uh, Bobby's brother wrote a lot of poetry about that, about Christian science and about his brother always being there. Like he's still with me. I still know he's with me and things like that. And it was just really sensationalized by the press. Um, yeah. So Flora Frank did not go insane. Um, she helped establish a um, memorial building for Bobby in his honor, um, and that uh, became a youth center, which is actually still a youth center today. It's not named after Bobby anymore, but it still exists. Um, and she became a Christian science uh, practitioner, like actually, you know, uh, she had her own office downtown. Uh, so she, she, you know, continued living her life. But it is tragic to see what people have kind of done with her story just because they misunderstood her religion. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. All right. Any other thoughts, questions that anybody has for Eric? This has been a fantastic presentation and definitely the connections to, you know, how he, yeah, thank you very much. Um, 
it's a it's a really interesting story. So um, we'll look forward to spreading the word about your book and cool. you know making sure that people can can learn more about this. Because yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you everybody for listening. Yep. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it very much. And uh, look for more Illinois Ornithological activities and events. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this was excellent. Really <laughs> appreciated. Um, I'm glad. Yeah. It's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a lot to, I had no idea the depth of there we go. I knew he was a complex person. I had no idea the depth. So yeah, really, I was just kind of sitting there going, what? <laughs> I, it's amazing. It's amazing. Like the, the amount of things that he did and the amount of like emotions that he had. And things, it's just like, yeah, it's hard to put it all into one person. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting. I That was much, really fascinating. So I'm glad. No, I'm I hope very... I didn't get too much of the ornithology wrong. I'm not an ornithologist, so. <laughs> It's quite all right. It was a really like it was a nice connection to a very, you know, like that's a tangential part, but it's obviously like it was um, intricate, in, integral to the story of like his life, but also like that he kept that's kind of the thing that he kept doing and staying a part of, um, you know, along with like his general character that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he stayed true to. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, this was, this was very, very interesting. So thank you again. And, uh, we'll, um, I'll definitely spread the word. Hopefully thank you. more people can hear this story. So yeah. thanks. <laughs> thank and if you very need, much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'll thank Jared. Jared is the one who actually recommended and connected us. So. Yeah. Oh yes. Thank you, Jared. Good to, yeah. good to see you again. Yeah, Jared, we appreciate it. Loved it. I love yeah. your book. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Yep. All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to.